and uh, everyone at the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network for once again uh, hosting uh, a webinar uh, on topics that are of interest and importance to people in the cancer community and, and people who are um, affected by health policy writ large. Um, this webinar series is, is unique uh, and, uh, and it's always great to come back and, and, to, uh, and to participate and, and help, uh, help moderate this and especially on a, on a, on a day like today because um, although I always mention the, the CCSN team and, and thank uh, Jackie and Mona and all the leaders here, um, this is the first time in, I, I moderated many of these webinars that I've managed to get um, one of the panelists that I've always wanted to have on here and always mention every time. And I'll just quickly flip to, uh, to the next slide, um, if I can. Um, and, and that, of course, is President and CEO of the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network, Jackie Manthorn. Um, uh, and it's, it, it was all very fortuitous and obvious um, why and how uh, uh, this came to pass. Um, uh, but first, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce uh, uh, Dawn and then I'll introduce Jackie properly, although she doesn't need much, much formal introduction. So, um, uh, Dawn Sankton works with us at, at 360 Public Affairs as a senior associate and, and communications expert, uh, over 20 years of experience in, in the life sciences. Um, uh, sector and industry sector, um, but also a lot of, uh, of uh, pro bono and other support and, and client work with uh, Less Pox Science um, uh, and other, uh, uh, other initiatives like that. Um, and a journalist uh, uh, background before that, and there are a few people that I know who are able to um, uh, look at uh, some challenging uh, you know, statistics and numbers and, and qualitative uh, research and, uh, and, and help help communicate that so that it's um, of interest, actionable and, and important. So Don, thank you for, uh, for joining us on this webinar because you, uh, you know the numbers and, and, uh, and also uh, a lot of the qualitative stuff that came through on the survey we're gonna talk about. Um, Don's gonna be followed uh, by a discussion with, a uh, moderated discussion with both Don and, and Jackie Manthorn, President and CEO of the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network and um, one of the, the, the leading uh, patient uh, advocates or patient group advocates in, in the country, um, especially focused on cancer, um, but really viewed broadly across the country as a, as a leader of the patient community. So uh, just thrilled to, to be able to get you out, Jackie, for this, uh, this webinar. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, so we're gonna, uh, I guess we can click forward here and I'm gonna go through what we'll discuss. I'll, I'll, um, I'll highlight a few cancer trends that uh, I think will set up how and the why this um, uh, this survey came to pass, and uh, and then I'll pass it over to Dawn to talk about the survey. And um, you'll see that we it's a CARP cancer survey, and and that's because the Canadian Association for Retired Persons uh, um, undertook the survey of its membership, which is which is in the hundreds of thousands. I think they said almost 400,000 Canadians across the country, um, and growing every year. Um, and there, there are a few organizations that have the finger on the pulse of um, uh, this, this growing and uh, very uh, active population. And everyone knows uh, knows CARP. They were they were an excellent partner for this. And, and the survey, um, like this webinar, was uh, was was supported by uh, Merck Canada. So I want to uh, make sure that that's um, that's known as well. So uh, I'll pass it over to Don to walk through um, what the survey was and how it, it was conducted and what the results were. Um, and he'll also walk through some select survey results. Um, what does that tell us? Um, what did the respondents say about the healthcare system? Some views on the health system, the need for investments and some, some general knowledge of the cancer burden and, uh, and some treatment options. Uh, and just to let people know too that that survey um, uh, summaries of it are starting to get published on on the CARP website, but we would welcome any additional questions around it so that we can make, make sure that, um, that, 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 you know, we, we can uh, disseminate some of that knowledge uh, even better or more effectively. So this, this webinar and very interactive, get your questions ready, is, is, a, is the first time that, that we've, we've been able to really uh, bring this out in, in a more engaging way and hopefully get uh, people on the line to um, uh, to give us some feedback and, and ask some great questions. So get those ready. There's a dialogue box and, and you'll see it on the right. Ask them as we're speaking. So don't you don't forget them. 
and we'll go back and we'll do, we'll do our best to talk through them. And uh, we may not, not have all the answers, but we, we, we will commit to going through the data and, um, uh, and getting back to you if not. So cancer trends. Um, a lot of people know um, some of these key stats, uh, but in fact, there are over 200,000 new cancer uh, cases uh, every year. And the increase in the diagnosed cancer cases is, uh, is increasing rapidly. So this is the Canadian Cancer Society statistics. Between 2015 and 2030, uh, you're going to see a 40% increase in, uh, in, in new cancer cases. The, the, the stat that really sticks um, with people is that one in two Canadians will be diagnosed with cancer. So if you're sitting listening to this webinar with, in, a, in a big group, just look around you and, and um, or in the mirror, and, and you'll know, and as many people in this, in this community know already, that, that it's everyone uh, is either knows somebody or or is um, or, or, or will have cancer in, in their in their lifetime. And unfortunately, cancer continues to be um, one of the, the top uh, two leading causes of death. Um, uh, and we have 80 to 1,000 Canadians who who pass away from cancer each year. Um, one in four is expected to die of, of cancer, um, and we're hoping that, that that ratio, of course, changes um, rapidly. And I think that that's that's something that um, you know, I don't know, Jackie, if you want to jump in here because you you said it so well about the cancer survivor community, your job is to increase that ratio, right? Yes, and uh, although more and more people are being diagnosed with cancer, and that will continue into the future. We should also realize that because of earlier diagnosis and better treatments, that there are more and more people surviving cancer uh, in the long term. Um, the estimates from the Canadian Cancer Society is that there are more than one million cancer survivors living in Canada today, and that's people who have had cancer and who have survived more than 10 years. So that's also a significant fact. And the last fact is it's an economic issue. Yes. $7.5 billion in, in, in total costs, um, which is which is a huge drag on our economy and, 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 uh, um, and health system that, that could be could be spent elsewhere. So um, but we're going to talk now about with where cancer is, is especially impacting um, Canadians. And many people don't don't maybe know this stat that. Uh, nine out of ten Canadians, ninety percent of Canadians with cancer are are actually over the age of of fifty, um, and uh, it, you know for the first time in the history of Canada, um, it happened in 2016. There were more Canadians older over over 65 than there were under 15, and and the the um, uh, the demographic over 65 is actually increasing at a rate that's double the size of the Canadian uh, population increase uh, year over year. In fact, uh, within a decade, seniors will will comprise over a, uh, a quarter, one out of every four, or one of every four uh, Canadians. Um, and this is the, the, the population that is most affected affected by cancer. Um, this is just a breakdown of of, of um, uh, the population per per province and the percentage change of the over 65 population. So, the the, the demographic challenge is actually impacting different parts of the country uh, differently as you can see Atlantic Canada especially except for um, little PEI that somehow is uh, um, uh, you know managing to, uh, to to be at the same rate as Ontario otherwise it's uh, um, you know averaging about 6.8 percent in, in Atlantic um, uh, and, uh, and and higher of course in, uh, in uh, um, part other parts of the country but this is um, well over double the, uh, the growth of the um, of the of the average Canadian population. So but there, there's some really good good news stories about this too, which uh, which I think we're going to get into in the discussion, building off of a, a really excellent event that we'll tell you about in a few minutes. But I want to spend a little bit more time uh, with with Don and, and Don. I'm going to turn it over to you. You can just ask uh, Kim or me to, to flip ahead of the slides and introduce us to the CARP survey. Great. Thanks very much, Bill. And uh, hi, everybody. Um, yes, so let's flip to the uh, first slide that uh, about this part of the presentation that tells about the uh, about the survey. So, as Bill said, it was con it was conducted by uh, by CARP and supported by Merck. Um, it was avail it was done online, made available to those uh, hundreds of thousands of CARP members uh, in the latter part of January and the first half of February this year. 
and had a really, uh, really good response rate of just under 4,000 people actually um, responding to the survey. Um, it's not on the slide, but I, I should mention that, of course, you know, since this is a survey of CARP uh, members, um, obviously the uh, respondents you know, skew to a, an older age, and about, I think 74% of people said they were uh, age 65 or older. Now, the, the great benefit of that, of course, is that that's, uh, the, that's an age group that has a lot of experience, unfortunately, with, uh, with cancer, but uh, uh, very valuable to get, their, uh, to get the benefits of that experience and their, uh, and their thoughts and insights uh, from that. So, um, and as Bill pointed out, there's three sort of separate sections that we'll go through there. First, about uh, gen what their general knowledge of cancer burden and treatments uh, is, uh, and then their perspectives on the healthcare system, and, uh, and also as well about clinical trials, some very interesting uh, information there. And uh, then finally, their views on the health system planning and investment. So uh, we can move to the next slide. And so the first uh, section we're going to talk about is this, uh, what their knowledge of the cancer burden and treatments uh, were. And I should say this was a bunch of uh, multiple choice questions. And uh, we can flip to the next slide and take a look at some of the results. And now, the, so the, the real take home message here is that the vast majority of respondents were really unaware of the impact of cancer. And I think this, um, is a really significant finding for for anyone who is talking about cancer to people is that uh, we can't take for granted that uh, everybody's on the on the same level in terms of knowledge and information just about basic facts about uh, about the burden of cancer so for example uh, only three percent of people were able to say that the canadian Ca cancer society had said there would be an 80% increase in cancer cases in the 25 years from uh, 03 to uh, 2028. Um, and uh, for example, 30% uh, of the people said this increase would, it would in fact just be 20%. So there's a great underestimation about the, uh, about the increases in cancer cases that, uh, that we've been experiencing in recent years and will experience into the future, as Bill pointed out, as the, as the population ages. Uh, only 14% uh, knew that cancer was the leading cause of death in Canada, and uh, um, uh, almost 60% actually said they thought it was, the, it was still the second leading cause of death. Uh, which it which it was for quite a number of uh, number of years, but again, this is an underestimation of the, the toll that cancer is taking in uh, in Canada. Um, that statistic about uh, one in two Canadians that can expect to get cancer has had quite a bit of publicity, but only 19% were able to uh, correctly identify that, and just about half actually 49% said that it was uh, it was only one in five Canadians that are expected to get cancer so again just a, a great underestimation about what the impact of uh, cancer is uh, in Canada and um, 31 31% uh, were able to correctly say that 25% uh, of Canadians will die of cancer and again most people uh, underestimated that, uh, or the 30% uh, said that they, they thought uh, only 15% of Canadians would die of cancer. And interestingly, in those statistics was that there was um, there was also a, a great underestimation about the burden of lung cancer, which uh, um, you know certainly advocates for uh, for lung uh, for lung cancer have uh, long been said that there's a misunderstanding about the the impact of the disease, and this survey backs backs them up very well. Thirteen, only 13% said correctly that lung cancer is the most diagnosed uh, cancer, and uh, you might not be surprised that the 47% uh, people uh, people thought that uh, breast cancer was the most diagnosed cancer, and uh, additionally, only 27% would could correctly say that lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths and uh, and again it was the it's the the cancers that tend to have um, to, to get talked about more that uh, people therefore think 
automatically uh, you know have a larger toll on Canadians but uh, but of course lung cancer is in fact the leading cause of cancer death so uh, some very interesting things and I think the take-home message here is uh, as I said that we we can't take for granted uh, when we're talking to any audience that everybody is on the same wavelength in terms of uh, in terms of information about cancer so next slide please um, now so the uh, good news is that um, uh, most people are familiar with what are, were the, uh, the three traditional pillars of cancer therapy, and 95% saying they're familiar with surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Uh, on the newer therapies, though, um, uh, immunotherapy, uh, which is you know, being referred to now as the new fourth pillar of cancer therapy, only half of Canadians are already familiar with that. Uh, that's not a bad number, and it's uh, probably rising. But uh, and again, uh, we then asked people if they sort of if they understood what that term uh, meant, and uh, roughly the same number of uh, people were correctly able to say that it is a drug that harnesses the body's own immune system to detect and kill cancer cells. Um, almost 40% had no answer to that question, just sort of hadn't heard about it. Um, interestingly, 7% confused that term with, uh, with vaccines, because obviously vaccines work on the immune system as well. But, uh, and then 6% uh, said they thought it worked by dest destroying the immune system uh, rather than augmenting the, the immune system. So uh, a little bit of misinformation there. So we'll move on to the next slide. And this looks at, we had, there were several questions in the survey that uh, allowed people to make comments. And uh, very, I think it's telling by itself that people were very, very forthcoming in, with, uh, with comments, uh, with almost 1,900 comments uh, written in there uh, in the survey. Uh, just that, uh, and covering a huge range of, uh, uh, information and emotions and opinions that the, that people have uh, about cancer just very very indica indicative of the 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 really big toll that uh, cancer uh, takes on uh, on individuals and how it you know leads people to very very strong uh, opinions on it so um, at the end of each of these sections that uh, that I'm presenting I'm just going to give a, f a few of the comments that we got related to this particular section about knowledge were these two interesting comments I mean, a very informative presentation look forward to seeing more surveys emphasizing the importance of knowledge so I think that's a, a very a good thing to keep in mind and then this other comment wow I thought I knew the answers to the first set of questions but only got one right seems we need more exposure to those stats. Um, and that comment comes because in the survey, after we'd asked all of these knowledge questions, um, we put people out of their misery and actually gave them what the correct answers were. So they were able to tell right away how, uh, how informed or, uh, or lacking in information that, that they were. And uh, as you can see, this person was really uh, found themselves quite surprised that they that they'd only got one of them one of them right. Um, so hopefully we uh, hopefully we helped uh, spread a little bit of uh, correct uh, cancer knowledge at least to the 4,000 people who answered the uh, answered the survey. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, it, in the second part here, we're going to look at uh, look uh, at what the survey uh, respondents had to say about the current state of the healthcare system and with treat and treating cancer in particular, and a look at their uh, attitudes towards clinical trials. So let's go to the next slide. And here we ask people, this is a really key point, I think, for anyone who's, uh, who's faced a cancer diagnosis or has a loved one or a friend with a cancer diagnosis, is that agonizing period between getting, getting that diagnosis and then actually being able to start doing something, hopefully positive, you know, to, to help it. You know, how long does it take to get treatment or surgery uh, started to do it? So we can see that um, about half uh, were able to get surgery or treatment within a month, 11% uh, actually within a week, 40% in uh, one to four weeks. Um, and then 29% uh, 
had to wait into the second month before they uh, before they would get going. And one in five, almost one in five, 19 percent of people had to wait greater than two months uh, from the time of diagnosis till the time that the surgery or treatment uh, began. Now, in, in some cases, there's probably some good reasons for that, but uh, but that's a very agonizingly long uh, period of time for one in five cancer patients to have to wait. So next slide, please. There we are. Um, so in the section two, we also asked uh, people what their experience was on um, about uh, uh, cancer screening. And we had over 3,000 uh, responses uh, to, to the, this question, these set of questions. And 32% um, actually said that they had had a CT scan to detect uh, a cancer. Uh, um, and then with colon cancer, a pretty high number. And again, remember the demographic that we're uh, uh, that we're talking about here in, in response to this uh, survey. So 70% said they had had a colonoscopy for colon, to detect colon cancer, and 65% said they had done a, a stool test for uh, for the same purpose. Um, as for lung cancer, however, only 33% said they'd had a chest X-ray to detect lung cancer. So again, here's a, a sort of an under an underrepresentation of uh, of lung cancer or under you know uh, under screening uh, for lung cancer. Um, and then among women, uh, and this was the highest percentage in terms of a screening tool that seems to have been used, but 73% of women said that they'd had a mammogram for uh, breast cancer, and 68% of pap smear for cervical cancer. Um, and then among men, 63%, they'd had a digital exam to detect possible prostate cancer. And uh, again, probably not surprisingly, you know, given the demographics of the uh, respondents, just 1.5% have actually had a vaccination to prevent cervical or other cancers, which um, are, of course, are now being given routine, routinely to uh, uh, to youth um, to prevent those cancers, but uh, that's something that's only been happening, of course, in the last uh, in the last several years. So uh, not too surprising to see that 1.5% uh, number in uh, in this uh, sample of people. So the next Don, just slide, a, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry to pause on this slide briefly, but I, I was I was hoping, Jackie, have these numbers changed over your time working in cancer? You've been on this a long time. Is screening is this ticking up in the way that you would like to see? Uh, in some cases, I think so, but in others, uh, I think the uh, lung cancer detection, uh, the screening rate there is really low, and that's because no one, no province as yet has uh, a screening program for lung cancer. Ontario has three pilot projects, one Toronto, one in Ottawa, um, one in Sudbury, uh, and they're finding that instead of diagnosing lung cancer at stages three and four, they're actually diagnosing people with lung cancer at stages one and two, where uh, there's much more of a chance that the disease can be controlled and even that people can go into long-term remission. Um, one of the issues, I think, uh, with, with screening um, is that it has changed over time. I think that colon cancer screening has gone up myself. Uh, lung cancer always has been uh, fairly high uh, of men. Uh, with 63%, that could really be a lot higher because a digital exam can be done in your doctor's office. Uh, I think, and, and this is not to insult or uh, discriminate against the men in the room, <laughs> that men are as likely as women to take part in screening programs. Uh, and often a lot of men, I've spoken with a lot of men who've been di actually been diagnosed with early and sometimes later stage prostate cancer, and they've said, well, my wife made me go. My, my, my wife, my girlfriend made me go and have this test. Uh, so we have some improving to do, and I think that over time, uh, we've spent a long time uh, getting women to have mammograms. Uh, and this is why I think when you were talking about the survey, um, that um, a lot of people thought that breast cancer was the highest uh, rate of diagnosis. We know it's not, um, but uh, it's because of all the publicity uh, that groups and that screening programs have done. And I think it's, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the longest standing screening program in the country. 
uh, and that's why rates are high. They could all be higher. Wouldn't it be great if we got to 100% yeah, on screening. all of them? I, I, Jackie, I just knew that you would have some um, uh, more information on on this response rate. So sorry, Don, to have uh, uh, cut into uh, in, into the stats. Uh, I just want no, to quick pause there. Great to have that input, um, and uh, yeah, very valuable perspective. So thanks, Jackie. Um, so let's look at the next slide. So this uh, starts our section on, on the survey where we ask people about clinical trials, which are, of course are absolutely vital part of uh, the development of new treatments for cancer or for any other conditions, but with uh, huge uh, changes and uh, dramatic uh, um, developments in cancer therapies, uh, even, even more so in, uh, in cancer than in uh, many other disease areas right now. Um, so 76% of people uh, who had had a cancer diagnosis said that they had, uh, uh, they had never been offered participation in uh, a clinical trial. But uh, you know, that may, a quarter of people were. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty significant number of Canadian cancer patients who, uh, you know, who were uh, given an opportunity to take part in a, in a clinical trial. So in a lot of the uh, you know, healthcare and pharmaceutical you know, policy discussions that go on, the importance of having a, a research and promoting a research ecosystem in Canada that uh, promotes the uh, having clinical trials happen in Canada uh, often comes up and it talks about that uh, from the point of view of having a strong uh, research, clinical research community. But uh, and and then people say and and oh and by the way patients can benefit from this. But I think it's very significant to see that fully a quarter of uh, cancer patients uh, seem to be having the uh, the the door open to them to possible participation in these uh, clinical studies. So it's not a minor aspect of our um, of our healthcare system actually. Now as it turns out, uh, so five uh, percent of people. Uh, were offered but didn't want to participate. Uh, another 4% uh, were offered but for whatever reason were not eligible to enroll because these clinical studies have very, very specific and strict uh, requirements about who can, who can enroll, enroll and who is, who is not eligible so that they can um, uh, very clearly evaluate what it is they're trying to evaluate in the study. Uh, and then a further 2% they, they thought they were all right when they, and they were enrolled in the study, but then at some point uh, were rejected uh, after they had enrolled. But, uh, but 13 percent, so that's like uh, one in six uh, Canadian patients, uh, actually uh, were enrolled in a clinical trial and received, tra uh, received treatment. So again, uh, that's a pretty significant proportion. Uh, that we have to think about when we're looking at policy questions regarding what is what is the environment in Canada for attracting uh, clinical trials here because it's a very uh, competitive environment globally to attract these clinical trials that are often uh, conducted in multiple centers uh, in various countries around the world. So uh, it's a very interesting finding. So let's look at the next slide and see among the people who who did uh, uh, take part uh, in in a clinical trial? And actually, there were over 300. I think it was 330 uh, responses that we got to this to uh, this question. Uh, <clears throat> people who had actually taken part in a clinical trial, and as you can see, uh, the results were really very positive. With um, that's about 60% really saying that their experience overall was positive. With uh, most of them saying very positive. A uh, big chunk of people saying it was neutral, and really only 13% uh, down at the other end of the scale saying that they'd had a, a, a more negative experience in clinical trials. So, um, all in all, very, um, very positive uh, result from that. Let's look at the next slide. And this was asking other uh, people, and this uh, from in this question, I think we had over 2,500 responses. Um, where so we said if you had cancer and were offered participation in a clinical trial, how would you react? And uh, so we've got almost 80% of people said that uh, that they would. Uh, you know, 38% you know wouldn't hesitate to say yes. 41% uh, would hesitate a little bit, but 
feel, feel that they would ultimately say yes. Um, and uh, and this is uh, this is uh, quite understandable. Sixteen percent that said they'd consult with their doctor and follow whatever their their doctor advised. But uh, you know, only five percent uh, really felt that uh, no matter what, they would likely not want to take part in a clinical trial. So. So again, this is further evidence of how important it is to have an environment where uh, clinical trials are uh, are available to patients because uh, their patients seem to be keen to we would be keen to take part and uh, and quite a, a, a large a significant number uh, can get uh, can get treatment from that as well from them as well too. So uh, let's go to the next slide and see what people's comments were about this. Uh, 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 about clinical trials, and there's, uh, there's some uh, very interesting ones. Um, sorry, the first one said, I researched and asked for a referral to the clinical trial, so someone very proactive in looking for it. Uh, and some pretty positive uh, experiences and uh, very encouraging experiences. A friend with stage four breast cancer was part of a drug trial and has been cancer-free for over 15 years. Uh, immunotherapy new treatment saved my life. Uh, my best friend was given a clinical trial treatment, and it was successful. Uh, so those are, you know, pretty, uh, uh, pretty impressive uh, uh, testimonies about uh, clinical trials. Another one: I dropped out of a trial that could have led to an autologous stem cell transplant. My daughter was fortunate to receive immunotherapy. And the next comment, uh, really moving: uh, My granddaughter received the most amazing treatment at Sick Kids. She was on, in a trial for CAR T cell therapy after her third relapse from leukemia, and is now strong and healthy and still getting great checkups. Um, so this is this uh, you know very new uh, treatment that's now actually has been approved and uh, and available in Canada uh, following uh, clinical trials such as this one that this uh, person obviously took part in at uh, Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. Um, uh, very interesting therapy. So, and the next comment was um, uh, it was talking about receiving uh, a treatment on a compassionate basis that was supplied by Bayer at, through Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto, and uh, said the cost would have been thirty-seven thousand dollars. Thanks, thanks Bayer. Um, and then the final comment is uh, you know, is a, a less positive one. It's a kind of uh, issue that can arise. So the trial demanded travel to downtown Toronto every day for a couple of months, and the expense was too much. And and that I think leads us to you know we have to remember that uh, this, is, this is one of the challenges of uh, clinical studies that are most often being conducted through uh, through our uh, bigger uh, big city hospitals. Uh, not all of them, mind you, but many of them are. And uh, and of course, not all people, not all Canadians have uh, easy uh, easy access to, uh, to to going there. And as this comment commenter uh, said, you know, it, it can be quite demanding in terms of you know having to go every day for a couple of months. So, um, anyway, a very interesting range of comments uh, to complete that section. So let's move on to the next uh, and the final section of the survey results. And this was about people's views about uh, a bit looking more looking towards the future and how ready the health system is to face that uh, coming tsunami or onslaught of uh, of cancer patients that's that's already upon it and uh, and is only going to grow uh, from now. So how how do people think the health system is doing? So let's look at the next slide, please. Well. Uh, not so great, I guess, would be the conclusion. So less than half, 47% think that the health system is well-equipped and treats cancer uh, efficiently. 29% uh, think it's slow and, you know, and there's some problems, but that in the end, most get treated, treated well. So that's, uh, I guess that's the good news that you've got sort of three quarters of the patients uh, ending, ending up doing well. But We've got pretty well a quarter of the uh, patients uh, saying that the system's problems result in patients not receiving optimal care. And of that, about you know half of those uh, those people uh, say the system is slow and inefficient, so they don't get the best treatment they deserve. And and the other half of those people, the 
fully, you know, 13% of the total feel that the system is totally overwhelmed, so many don't get the best or timely treatment. And this is, you know, obviously reflective of the experiences then that uh, that Canadians are having uh, with their healthcare system. And uh, when you've got uh, an illness as serious as and life-threatening as cancer, and you've got a quarter of people saying that they feel that the system is not giving patients the kind of optimal care uh, maybe that they, that they deserve. Um, you know, that's, uh, we've, there's clearly some challenges that, we, uh, that uh, lie ahead uh, for the system. So uh, the survey then asks, uh, well, you know, what should the system be doing about this? So let's look at the next slide. And... Uh, Unfortunately, more than half, 52%, do not think the health system is ready to face uh, this future wave of, uh, of cancer, uh, cancer patients. 8% think it's not ready at all. 44% say simply not ready. 27% are neutral. And on the positive end, you've only got one in five people who think that it's either ready or very ready, and, and only 2% thinking that it's, that it's very ready. So there's, you know, there's very clearly that people think that uh, work needs to be done uh, to improve the, the preparedness of the health system for, uh, for to meet the needs of cancer patients. So let's uh, look at the next slide, and we've got uh, we asked two questions about um, uh, what we think should be done, and one was you know uh, should. In, should ensuring better uh, screening and timely treatment of cancer be a, 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 the top priority of my provincial or territorial health system? And we had 90% uh, agreement on that with 63%, uh, so almost uh, two out of three, strongly agreeing with, uh, with that, 27% agreeing, only 7% disagreeing with uh, that statement that cancer uh, should be a top priority of the of the public health system. So uh, something to bear in mind. We also had 90% uh, of people. You can flip the slide, please. Uh, on the other question that we had, 90% 90, uh, 90 uh, agreeing um, with the, that the health system should make new investments to be better prepared to treat to, to treat cancer. So in other words, they're saying. We need to do more, um, and we need to invest now in order to do that. 54% strongly agreed with that. 37% agreed, uh, and uh, only 5% actually disagreeing with the need for for new investments. So, you know, maybe this is a relevant uh, sort of thing to uh, to look at when uh, certainly the uh, healthcare topic of the of the day, or certainly of this week, is you know about whether we should invest in new national pharma care program or, or other things, but uh, uh, in this survey, uh, people certainly uh, felt that there should be a new investment to help treat, uh, to help treat cancer. So let's uh, flip the slide, please. And uh, we can look at these comments that uh, came about that were in this section about the, uh, about the healthcare system. Uh, one pretty straightforward, they need to prepare now uh, there's little evidence of a coherent system. Um, and this, the next one's a, a rather perceptive and uh, a useful comment, I think, too. The health system is not prepared for the dementia tsunami that's coming as well. This should be a top priority as well as cancer. So, uh, you know, certainly cancer is not the only, uh, the only thing that uh, uh, the health system has to look at as the population ages. Um, a very positive comment. When cancer was a possibility, the steps to treatment were swift. I am so very grateful. And you know, there were a lot of very positive statements among those uh, 1900 uh, comments that were there. A lot of people, you know, were really very incredibly grateful about uh, uh, and complimentary about how how good the care was. But on the other hand, there were a lot of people, um, you know, whose experience wasn't nearly as well. Uh, so here's someone said, wait times need to be decreased. Uh, the system is already overloaded. Um, cutbacks and or no new funding will and does hinder the future of our healthcare system, which we are blessed to have. Um, here's someone who obviously feels the system is ready, said the health system is aware and is prepared to deal with this disease. 
And uh, then the, uh, finally a comment saying it's inconceivable that in the Canadian health system, all costs related to the treatment of cancer are not covered uh, by, um, uh, by the public health care. So um, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, you can flip the slide. And um, uh, that's the end of my presentation of the uh, survey results. And I'll hand it back over to Bill to moderate our discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Don. Uh, that was a great walkthrough. Um, and before we, we, we head into discussion, I, I want to acknowledge that um, this isn't a traditional survey that's put out to the general population that would be random, where people are calling you, that there, there is some potential for selection bias here. People were motivated to, uh, to, to respond to this among the hundreds of thousands of CARP members. Um, but I was overwhelmed by the amount of qualitative feedback, the, the comments that came through, over 1,900 of them, um, that were often unprompted. And, and, and what this could do um, is actually lead to additional research, both qualitative and, and qualitative, and I just want to give a shout out to one of our um, our listeners who uh, um, was was listening carefully when we talked about clinical trials, um, noting uh, a recently completed study from ARC, the um, Canadian Center for Applied Research in Cancer Control, um, that did uh, some uh, analysis with um, key informant interviews with clinicians and clinical research professionals around barriers to clinical trials. Um, it would be great to, to take a look at that. This is an opportunity to talk to, to um, patients and people who are actually uh, affected by or maybe offered clinical trials and maybe match up that. So really encourage um, uh, more listeners to, to um, send in information like that. And, uh, and, and after this webinar, we'll definitely uh, circulate links to, to that study and, and even where, where some of this data is being uh, posted on the CARP website. So um, just a couple of kickoff questions and we'll come back to... Uh, um, the, the, uh, the list of ones that are coming in, so keep them coming. But, but to Jackie, um, the first question, what, what's your reaction to, to the results in general? Were, were you surprised, anything surprised you in there? Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I think that this is um, fairly typical of our cancer, healthcare and cancer care system at the moment. And I, as, as I was listening and reading uh, the comments, I was thinking, isn't this part of the reason that these things are happening and the disparity and between people who say it was great and other people who are saying it's, it's horrible? Uh, part of that could be geographic differences. We know that in some parts of the country, the, their health and cancer care systems are not functioning well for various reasons. My own home province of Nova Scotia is having a health care crisis right now. And I'm sure there are other provinces uh, which are as well. And then there are some provinces where uh, the healthcare system is functioning better. And I don't think that that's not to blame anyone. I think it has to do sometimes with size of population and just ability to attract healthcare workers and keep healthcare workers. Um, I wanted to mention though, um, that this, uh, this topic was also uh, raised during our recent, in fact, Tuesday, uh, CCSN legislative reception on Parliament Hill it was a very successful uh, reception, uh, the standing room only. Um, and we were able to discuss both uh, the impact of the wonderful new treatments that are starting to be used, plus uh, to give some basic information about the results of the survey. Uh, we've been following that up with uh, meetings with uh, MPs and senators and staff. And we will be uh, later this year, quite a bit later this year, uh, repeating the process in, at Queen's Park uh, in the legislature of Ontario. Um, I think the main question or the huge question is, will these new treatments be available to all patients, including seniors? Uh, in other words, the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Um, I also think that one area uh, that, to my knowledge, hasn't really been touched in terms of, of cancer care for seniors and in fact healthcare in general is cancer and healthcare in nursing homes as or residences for, for seniors uh, who are not able to look after themselves. Uh, I did some research years ago and I could only find one published paper on this and it gave it pointed a very dismal picture of the stage at which cancer was diagnosed in nursing homes. That was in the United States. 
and I haven't seen anything on Canada, but I think it's an area that as the number of cases of dementia and Alzheimer's grow with the uh, aging of uh, the baby boom, uh, I think that this is something that we really need uh, to look at. How are they being treated? How are they being diagnosed? What kind of healthcare and with what regularity are they receiving it? And that's a good, seg not segue, but link up to the fact that the, the Canadian Medical Association um, is is asking political parties in the next election to to um, implement a seniors healthcare strategy uh, that we we really haven't had anything coordinated at the national and federal level. Um, and th actually, the day before uh, the CCSN parliamentary reception, the CC the, the CMA had had one in Ottawa too, um, and they managed to interact. I saw with some some people in the cancer community, and they 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 were talking about um, dementia, Alzheimer's is really important. But I did see um, uh, some folks from the cancer community there say, "Hey, you know, uh, cancer is also uh, um, uh, a real growing issue for for the Canadian population, the seniors population." Um, let's make sure that that's an issue as well. So it, I, I think it's um, uh, it seems like there's a lot of momentum towards the federal election that's coming up. Uh, there was one question actually on 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 the line. Uh, this might be a segue. And Don, you you mentioned it briefly. Um, thoughts on on universal pharmacare recommended by Dr. Hoskins and how this this water could affect um, cancer patients and um, I'll throw it out to to uh, to, to the panelists uh, to, to to talk a little bit about that, and I can even offer a, a center to myself if you like. But Jackie, what do you what do you think about yesterday? Um, I was surprised that it was a single payer universal system. Uh, we actually uh, had submitted done a submission to the commission, uh, and we had suggested that it uh, essentially cover those who weren't covered and provide help to those who would max out the plans that they already had. Uh, and I think one of the reasons we did that is we weren't sure, um, first of all, how a single payer universal system would be paid for. Uh, and our main concern about Pharmacare right from the beginning uh, was what will the formulary look like? If it's the lowest common denominator formulary, then uh, there are many, many patients, and not just of cancer, but of other chronic illnesses, um, and rare diseases who may find themselves without coverage. And one, for one thing, we want to one thing we want to make sure of is that we don't go backwards and take coverage away from people who already have it. Thanks, Don. Did you have any thoughts reading yesterday uh, um, and, and watching Dr. Hoskins present the report? Well, I, I was struck by a comment that was made about. Uh, how uh, how we should have a pharmacare system that works just as well as our current Medicare system does, and I was thinking of what the opinion, the feedback we got from this survey, and I said, well, uh, I'm not sure that we want to uh, set our sights that low if uh, if if we're going to have a system, you know, that uh, uh, you know. While yes, we appreciate uh, the current uh, universal parts of our of our healthcare system. Uh, it's uh, it's certainly not a perfectly, as this survey shows, it's not a uh, perfectly running and perfectly tuned uh, system. So it 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 is a, I think it is a, a challenge and a and a debate that we need to have is to okay where do we where should if we're going to be injecting significant new amounts of money into uh, the healthcare the public healthcare system. Um, where do we want it to go? Uh, I mean, in this survey, people are indicating that there is a great need for investments for cancer care, as uh, was commented in uh, that comment. Said, you know, there's going to be a huge wave of uh, of uh, dementia as well. Uh, so it's, a, I think, it's a matter of, uh, you know, I think we really need to have that discussion about. Uh, uh, you know what are what are should what should our top priorities for public health spending be? And, and that that is um, um, almost a segue into the, the question of the federal election that's coming up uh, on October 21st. Um, uh, what is the CCSN planning with respect to to the election and uh, um, anything that the you know that the membership uh, or I should say the listeners on the line might might want to know and get ready for? 
Well, we will be asking questions of all parties and on federal level and also uh, CCSN has a tradition of asking questions of all the candidates for whom we can find contact information to raise awareness of what our issues are. And also, uh, we know that one of them will be elected, so we're looking for champions later on. Um, our, of course, we'll ask a question about a national pharmacare. I think anyone who's asking questions in terms of healthcare or cancer care will be asking that question in one way or another. Um, and for sure, we can expect a lot more information to come out about what it will actually mean and how it will actually function. Uh, for me, I, I've always said right from the time that uh, uh, the commission was announced that the elephant in the room were the provinces and territories who will have to opt in. Uh, so that remain, it remains to be seen how that will work and whether it will work. But we have a few other questions and I'll just mention them uh, briefly. And if anyone wants to know, they can contact me. Uh, you can find my email on our website. One is the fact that 15 weeks employment insurance sickness benefits is not long enough for cancer patients or anyone diagnosed with a serious illness. And number two is how difficult it is to get Canadian pension plan disability benefits. So we are going to ask those questions and push on those two issues uh, when the next government is elected. Uh, I think it's really important for people to let uh, their uh, candidates in their writings know what they think. Uh, invite them in when they come to your door, <laughs> give them an earful, uh, go to all candidates' uh, meetings and, and raise your hand and ask a question. Um, healthcare is such a fundamental, in a sense, a fundamental, uh, we consider it a fundamental right, and we have to fight to keep it. And, and, and thanks for that. Just, um, we're, we're talking about, uh, about CARP, and one of the questions really early on is, what is CARP? I, I should I should have, you know, uh, it was just a scheduling uh, challenge at, at the CCSN breakfast earlier this week. There was a representative from CARP who was actually speaking, uh, the head of the Ottawa chapter. He was very eloquent and thoughtful, and he helped walk through some of the survey results. And I'm hoping this webinar will engender others where, where CARP will be able to participate. Um, but CARP is the Canadian Association of Retired Persons. Um, national nonpartisan nonprofit org organization that advocates on behalf of adults 45 and over. Um, so I can join next year, which is so exciting. Uh, won't get me any discount cards as, as other echelons of that, that uh, population would get you. But uh, anyway, at least I can get a membership. Um, uh, and I should say that CARP's reaction to uh, the Hoskins Council report was positive. They were they, they are, are strong proponents of a national pharma care program. Um, and, and, you know, seeing these kinds of results from their members hopefully will help inform uh, uh, their advocacy, but, but also, you know, layer on to other things that they're going to be active on in the election because uh, I know they are. Um, and and they, I have to say, in terms of, um, uh, because I've been around public affairs for many years now, um, by far one of the, the, the strongest and most influential um, advocacy organizations in the country. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, um, this was a great opportunity for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network to work with with CARP on uh, on that, and then uh, um, and then come out with with today's uh, um, you know webinar. This is but the beginning of these conversations. So, um, let, let's keep it going. I, I don't see many other. Um, questions I think we're going to go into in, in, online and we're running a little bit short on time but just a, a few minutes left. Uh, Jackie are there any parting thoughts that you have or, or, or Don and then we'll, we'll we'll call it to a close unless somebody else um, jumps in? Well as I said in my speech on Tuesday at our parliamentary reception um, this generation baby boomer seniors as we come along is, is going to be different. Uh, there's much more of uh, an interest, I think, in uh, public affairs, in getting the resources and the services that we need. And I was joking with someone after it, uh, just wait, we'll take our placards and change the messages on them. And if we have a bad meal in the nursing home, we'll be singing, we shall overcome, and <laughs> <laughs> demonstrating out on the front lawn. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of people in this generation come from an activist background. And that's not going to change as, as they age. I think that's that's great closing thoughts, Jackie. Uh, Don, any any final thoughts before we close the webinar? 
Uh, no, well, just one quick one, and I think it's on this whole knowledge thing, and I think it's I think it's really important for people to get themselves informed when we're having these very crucial sort of national debates and on something that does affect everybody, like health care, cancer care. Um, and uh, I think it, it really is important uh, both for people to get in, uh, get well informed with the, with the facts about about things and uh, and then also for when when people are talking about these issues uh, to not assume that everybody does have all the uh, the facts I think that really came out very clear in the uh, general lack of uh, knowledge about some of the uh, some of the starting information here so I think if we can uh, if we can at least get people on a on a common knowledge foundation in order to have uh, an informed discussion I think the discussion of those healthcare priorities will be a lot, uh, a lot more uh, informed. Thanks so much, Don and and, and Jackie. Uh, it was great to get you out to a webinar, and, and I'm hoping that you had a lot of fun, and that, that, you know we could do it again. Uh, sure. <laughs> oh, excellent. See, uh, on air, you heard it yeah. first here. Yeah. Um, and and really thanks to all of the participants who who signed in, uh, um, asked some great questions, provided some great ideas and information. Uh, in terms of other links, because um, we presented a lot of numbers and, and, and uh, information that came out of this survey, um, let's do more. Uh, and so, let, you know, let's let, let's let this be, be the beginning of that that conversation, and because uh, it's a very important research question uh, that, that um, we can, we can actually start, you know, building a, a better and stronger system that we can maybe even move some of these numbers where people have a lot of confidence in in Canada's health system and, and social system. For the purposes of, of helping people with cancer so and I, I think one other thing let's realize that a lot more seniors are online and in social media than perhaps younger people realize uh, just the number of people who participated in the survey oh, and yeah. actually made comments uh, they know their way around the internet yeah it was something else so yeah so thanks very much everybody uh we'll, See you next time. And Kim, any final words uh, to, to close it out? As you have an outro, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone.